Should I tell that now? Yeah. So I went to the MTC, um, and like the same, I was happy go lucky. I was great. Like I was ready to go on a mission and, and, um, I felt like I had a really close personal relationship with God and I felt, uh, like I could make a lot of change. In fact, the day I, the day I got there, I was selected to be district president or not district president, district leader for my group MTC and district. yeah, MTC mm-hmm. district. Um, and language training is really, really hard. And, and there's sort of and an, at, like yeah, and, and, and immersive. Yeah. And, and there's sort of, a, of an atmosphere of this might, this probably won't work out for you if you are not solid, if you're not like totally clean, you know, and they, they really push it hard in the MTC. I remember that too. Just like, I, it felt like um, worthiness, I should say that's, it felt kind of scary to me uh the mtc did and i i felt really lonely when i was there because and i wasn't there for very long but um but so many of my peers around me just seemed to to love their experience and i just felt so isolated and lonely and and uncomfortable and awkward like i felt like so many of our activities and um you know the talks that were given to us were just um a lot more negative than I thought that MTC would be. I thought the MTC would be like this little missionary oasis where you just talk about Christ all the time, but it felt so focused on, um, you know, on guilt, on, yes. on trying to, to, to make us question our worthiness and our, um, and our testimony, like the strength of our testimony. And, and I, I think that, it's it was really difficult for for me to feel like um uh, like i felt so so completely in tune with my own spirituality and my own being but that that um um that that wasn't the focus it felt that like that wasn't me. yeah it you almost know, the wasn't the focus was on you know breaking us down and it was kind of was like really losing losing me. self which i understand like a, a yeah. concept of selflessness but it, basically, in, in order to do the best I could, I felt like I had to go talk to the branch president about my relationship with Madeline, because that's, mm-hmm. we... What about it? We <laughs> we had a physical relationship while we were dating. You were naughty. We were naughty, yeah. According to Mormon <laughs> so standards. Does, yeah, according to Mormon standards. We were actually really healthy with yeah. it. Everything was fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah in, so, what, in healthy standards, you were healthy. Yeah, in yeah. Standards. In, in psych, psych, uh, psychological you know, standards, we were healthy. In yes. non-Mormon standards, <laughs> I feel like we were very conservative still physically. Yes, you know, like yeah. We weren't. But not conservative enough to stay. Yeah. So they, <laughs> I talked to the branch president. He's like, yeah, you're solid. You're going to stay and go out on your mission. Great. And they sent me to the district president. And this is probably the most trauma I have from the church in general, um, was he, he like, well, I, I told him about like the situation. He wanted to know very specifically what happened. Um, and like, as it was unfolding, I was like, can I call Madeline? Like she's on a mission. And he's like, wait, what? She's on a mission. Um, so we'll get to that later. But but during this confession, he basically said, like, I need you to go back as far as you can remember about your sexual habits and history. So and had, you, had you lied or not been asked about love, chastity stuff with your bishop in Bountiful? Well, I wasn't meeting. I was meeting one at USU, a bishop at USU. Okay, okay. Yeah, but, um, but that's neither here or there. I, uh, mm-hmm. I guess, like, I definitely danced around the truth. Okay. Um, and so I like I t- take ownership for that for sure. But at the end of the day, what what I felt like my experience was as a human being in the MTC wasn't right. Yeah. Um, because when I actually sat down in the chair with this guy, it wasn't about what I just did. It was about what I had been doing my whole life. He wanted mm-hmm. to know, you know, like how long I had been experiencing sexual feelings, basically. And I talked to him for three hours about my life, and afterwards. Like, he just said, okay, we're going to send it to Salt Lake and we'll let you know. What kind of, and, and I'm not asking, I need to be very clear about this. This is not me asking for any purient sort of weird reasons. This ties to the Sam Young movement of Protect LDS Children about yeah. sexually explicit interviews. So that's why I'm asking this question. Yeah. What, tell us some of the like awful things he would ask you. Do you, do you mind if I just go into it and tell him? 
um like say things no, well ahead. yeah like he would ask me like like while performing digital sex which is like fingers or whatever he, would, he was like how many fingers did you use things like that mm-hmm. or like how 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 many times you know did was did oral sex happen how long did it occur for and like how did you feel before and how did you feel after and like mm-hmm you know, like how long you had known Madeline before this happened and like, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, just those like, why, like, why do you need to know that? Mm -hmm. And why does Salt Lake need to know that? Because that's Mm -hmm. what he kept saying is like, this is going to Salt Lake. I'm Mm -hmm. sending this to Salt Lake. He repeat that because I would Mm -hmm. pause and say, you know, he's like, this is going straight to the general authorities so they can review. And he said, we want to know your sexual history as like throughout your life because we want to establish whether or not there's a pattern. And I'm like, pattern of what? Of, of human feeling? Yeah, of human, that, uh, yeah. That like, has to be. Yeah, like, we could all talk about that. But, like, yeah. n- you know, it's not really, it's very invasive. But, of course, I. And retrospectively, very confusing that the general authorities have time to review. Review all that. These natural feelings yeah. of every, you know, <laughs> yeah. teen. That- <laughs> so then a- after that, um, they sent me back to Bandron training as if nothing had happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I spent 21 more days there. And mm-hmm. heard nothing, absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. And then he just called me into his office and said, hey, we got word back from uh, the first presidency and they say you need to go home. And so go call your mom and tell her to come pick you up. And I hadn't made any communication with my family about it, really. I mentioned that like some things were going on, but I didn't say I was going to go home or anything. Mm-hmm. So my mom is like, what? You're going on a mission right now. Like, what are mm-hmm. you doing? You're in the MTC. You're not going to come home. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, you just have to tell her to come home. And this whole time, I was trying to just talk to Madeline on the phone so that we could have a little bit of a like an adult conversation about what was mm-hmm. going on in our lives, but that was completely forbidden. Mm-hmm. And then your story is what I feel like, I don't know, you can go ahead. Yeah, Let's... so back to that question you asked about, um, you know, withholding information from authorities, um, you know, I thought it was interesting you mentioned, like, you know, I take accountability for that, but but I guess I feel a little bit more frustrated with that, that that accountability is the word that has to be used. Because, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, like, I, I had this, you know, peaceful, you know, understanding, uh, you know, friendly relationship in my home ward in Bountiful that I just felt like, um, like, you know, those bishops interviews and things could be uncomfortable, but I just felt like I, I had been known by these people for my whole life, which, you know, in a way is extremely uncomfortable to have just like neighbors and, you know, your friends, parents and stuff asking you these questions. And untrained. Too, but like. also like they, they knew, they cared about me because they saw me grow up they 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 cared about me as a person in a way that I felt like um I thought was Mormon related generally um when I realized that that's just human nature when you know somebody for the decades community to gather you know? around yeah them, for but... to, to care about somebody and to to use your judgment to think like well I know I know you as a person and you're a good person. Yeah, and like so, you are worthy. You, know, you, you don't should deserve, be out there. Yeah. you know, uh, criticism and, and, <laughs> and suffering and, you know, all these things. And I felt like when I went to, um, when I went to college at Snow College, um, I just felt so, uh, I guess my first experience talking to my bishop there was so... So different from mine, too. So negative that I was just so terrified to talk to him about anything because I felt like um, like he didn't know me as a person. He didn't understand my life and my background and hadn't known me for... He didn't know me at all, didn't ever talk to me outside of his office. And so it felt really um, especially inappropriate for him to be making judgments on me without knowing me. Um, I think it's important to note, too, um, when when we went to talk to our bishops while we were preparing to go on our missions, I went to my bishop, and I told him what kind of had happened this one time, and she told her bishop the same thing. Yeah, the same and thing, and we got told different me, reactions. Yeah, he told me that I was good, 
Yeah. Like, that I'm solid and I deserve to be on a mission and, and like, just to go on my way. But Madeline's And so I felt like, you know, we've experienced the same things and my bishop is hostile towards me and I'm not going to talk about my sexual life with a stranger who's hostile towards me. Um, And I just, my whole life had felt so in tune with God that it just made so much sense to me that, like, why use a third party as of the bishop to to make these judgments of whether or not I am worthy to go on a mission when God knows me perfectly. When God knows me perfectly and I feel clean and I feel worthy and I feel the spirit, the, all these things they tell me that I wouldn't feel if I wasn't worthy. worthy. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it's this bishop that's just not in line with me. And Jamie's bishop gave her the okay and you know, we gave the same stories, so I just felt like, you know, there was just a discrepancy there with my bishop, and God knew me perfectly, so I would go through the repentance process with God, you know, himself, rather than through a third party that didn't know know, me at all. And so, in my mind, I was worthy on my mission. I had gone through the repentance process. It was personal. It was spiritual. It was, you know, deeply rooted inside of me inside my being of what i thought my relationship you know with with that god was yeah. and um and so to have things happen. turn out the way they were was really unfortunate because we weren't allowed communication well yeah. while we were on our missions and you know i was doing my missionary routines Getting our, you know, our, our uh, co- contact, what do you call them? Contacts. Or, contact, yeah. ready for a baptism. And I, I just felt like things were just on a roll. Things were going so well. I had made so many friends, you know, with the members there and, um, and was, you know, learning so much from my lessons and felt so in tune with God. And then one night uh, I just got a call on our, you know, mission cell phone from my mission president saying we got a call from the MTC um, you know, uh, they, uh, is your, uh, fiance there? And I said, like, I just felt panicked, like, yes, yes, my fiance is there, what's going on? And, um, and he began asking me, you know, all the questions that Jamie had told the district president that had been sent to Salt Lake, that had been sent to my mission president, you know, you know, have you done all these, you know, things? Have you participated in oral sex? It's like this person you knew since childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my, you know, my classmate's dad asking me these questions of, you know, whether I performed oral sex and um, with my companion there beside me, like, how was I supposed to defend myself? What was your companion doing there? Do you know how missions work, yeah, you can't John? Be separated from <laughs> yeah, you're being interviewed with your companion. No, he called. He her. called me at like 11 p.m. Oh my yeah. god! In my apartment. And then he, so your companion's listening. Sort of like she can't hear his end, so I'm trying to be as discreet as I can, oh, of course, oh, saying nightmare. like, uh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And he said, "Pack your bags. You're going home in the morning." Um. <laughs> I was devastated. Um, and I was so confused because I had been in contact with my God personally, you know, for so long in preparation for this, so constantly throughout my mission. And to, to have this decision made without even a, you know, a fair conversation face to face with me in private. And we um, hadn't even spoken at haven't all. Haven't even spoken. Yeah. yeah, it just completely blindsided me. Um, and um, I was really sad to leave my mission. I love my mission. Um, and so, you know, I got on a plane and came home the next day, <laughs> cried all of the plane rides mm. home. Um, I still tried to savor the last missionary moments because I was still technically a missionary until I was released and so I gave out like three Book of Mormons on a plane and (laughs) (laughs) talked to everybody in the terminals on my layovers and you know uh, 
I was just so confused about, you know, why, you know, if God had part in this, why he would, you know, give the head of the church different information than he would give me. And if he wasn't a part of it, then I had completely lost my faith in the priesthood. Um, yeah, I... Who weren't in tune with the same God that I was. And I remember um, with my interview when I talked to him, one of the things he said uh, to me that stuck with me a lot, um, and it was very much, I, I feel like it's gaslighting in a lot of ways, was um, he just said that uh, like any spirituality that you felt like you had while these things were going on was not real. Was counterfeit. Was counterfeit. That's what he said, yeah. And to me, that's just like, you can't know. How am that. I supposed to be even how are you even be yeah, out how on? How are you supposed mission? to prove that? It's so personal. It's so spirituality. You yeah. know, inner spirituality that you have no proof and no authority. Yeah. You can't defend yourself. Um, it, so by the time I got out of the MTC and after that those days of waiting and stuff, I was just ready to be out of the MTC. Yeah. It definitely felt. Yeah, like um, you hadn't had that experience The mission, that yeah, yeah, like the mission, the, mission the, part. The um, I mean, independence with a companion by your side all the time. But, you know, like planning your days and, you know, feeling like God was guiding you rather than the, you know, kind of conveyor belt <laughs> the yeah. MTC. But as soon as we got back, it turned to Madeline and me, mm -hmm. like the entire, well, like, a very large portion of the interactions we had with people was just about getting me to go back. Yeah, because Whether, men, which you you know were considered at the time, were expected to 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 serve full time missions to be worthy. Priests whereas women priests, women all. weren't. So everybody was like, "Well, Madeline, you're yeah. fine, but Jamie, well, yeah. Jerem needs to go back. Yeah, and you and need to so get him to go back." When we came home, um, you know, I, I think I was still just in shock and and so so upset about losing my mission that was so important to me that I dreamed of since childhood, you know. Um, that part of me like just wanted to you know do whatever they asked of me to, to get back out there, but but part of me also remembered my um I mean, part of me was also devastated and betrayed and confused and, um, you know, didn't, didn't want to, to try to return from something that I was kicked out of, you know, when I was willingly there giving my time and my, you know, my money to the church and then, you know, kicked out because they didn't think I was worthy, but then they wanted me to come back. Like, it just, it, it felt insulting. And so I... We stuck to our commitment to each other. We said we we're would get, get married. married when we got back from our missions. And <laughs> yeah, we were it back. It was two months instead of two years, but we were back. And um, So you both served two months. Uh, well, she served like served, four months, right? No, I served Three like two and a half. I so you, did you go to Atlanta? Half. Yeah, because okay. I was only in the MTC for like a week. Okay, so you yeah. went to Atlanta for a month and a mm -hmm. half, two months. Mm -hmm. And I was in the MTC for like a month. Because you I, never went to no. Australia. No. Yeah. That, yeah, that was like the looming giant trip. that okay. made me okay. confess, to be yeah. honest. It was, it was, I didn't know where this place was. I had to learn this language. And I was like, yeah. shoot, I better. Be all the way across the world if it wasn't going to work out. Yeah. And, and, you know, I fully believed in the church at that yeah. time. Um, and if they told you that, you know, that you, if you got all the sins off your chest, then you could go out on your mission worthily. You didn't want to risk Yeah, that, I was like, hey, know? I'll just tell you. You're like, okay, and I'll then tell you, like, and then no. I can go out worthily yeah. and not risk, you know, uh, this counterfeit spirituality, you know, seeping into these members' yeah, lives that I'm, I'm trying I'm to touch. Jeffrey. It's, it's true, uh, you know, it's, it's from good intentions that, you know, <laughs> that you decided to give in to that pressure. I, I remember it was that talk by... Holland, who, where he basically was like, if you are not completely clean, the words will choke. And, you're, and of course, that's not true, but at yeah. all. But um, which also is why I felt like, you know, I'm clean. My words aren't choking. I'm loving yeah, my mission. Exactly. You know, I I yeah. feel like my 
you know, I would give lessons and I felt like I was connecting so much with members and with non-members and, and people cared about my story and my background and, uh, and it just, you know, and so that's, I felt completely blindsided feeling like, what do you mean? If that's counterfeit spirituality, then, then I've never felt real spirituality, whether I was or wasn't, you know, clean. Um, yeah, and she didn't even know this was coming. Yeah. Like, it just... Yeah. That's amazing to me that... Yeah. The what? And, it's amazingly frustrating, I, I should say, that yeah. that I had been fully informed in this situation of being able to, you know, like, know when I was... Kind of when I was going to hear back and that this thing was going on and Madeline was going on her mission and, and she didn't even have any idea. And then all of a sudden it was, Kay, you're going home. And it's like, what? No, I have a baptism so, date two days away from... Yeah, it was devastating know, like, for, you know, my missionary purposes, for my, you know, my plans, for my mission, for, you know, my, my in, internal goals, my relationship with my mission president, which was good, and he was also the dad of a kid I grew up with. Like, it was just really, like, shocking and sensitive and humiliating, um... And then and we to had be, to go home and right to be after. sent home. <laughs> to be sent home so abruptly, uh, without any notice. Um, and when you're when you're a missionary planning to you know serve your full mission, you expect the homecoming to be the you know traditional, you know, your whole family greets you and hugs you and are proud of you, and then you give a talk in church and everyone cares about your mission. Um and to come home from what I felt was a worthy mission, you know, to you know, my loving dad at the airport for me alone, um, to pick me up, and for my family to just not talk about it, for nobody to talk about it or well, ask me how it... There was talking, but it wasn't to us. Gone. And <laughs> it just felt like, uh, you know, no, nobody wanted to... It was such isolation to to have your reputation stripped from you and then for nobody to want to talk about it because it's, you know, taboo. Um, felt, I felt completely undeserving of that. Like, it, it felt so horrific to me to be treated that way when I tried so hard to be, you know... worthy that you know that that the reason I'm sent home isn't even isn't even a crime or yeah they said very specifically why but it was an expression of love you know it was an expression of love that I was sent home for and lost my reputation for and lost relationships with family for and um we had to meet with our state presidents when we got home um to, you know, be released from our callings, and, um, and I remember that was uh, kind of the difficulty of growing up in such, you know, like you said, like an intense place like Bountiful, where, you know, I grew up there, I knew everybody there, they knew me, and when you're in good standing in the church, it's such a beautiful feeling of community, but suddenly I wasn't, and my state president who was like my trek paw and we were like good friends before, before my mission suddenly treated me completely differently you know and told me you know I don't I don't oh, yeah. I don't think that you feel enough remorse for this and to to, to try sorry oh my god um you know, we he'd like uh, schedule meetings with. We did have meetings together with our state presidents, but he'd schedule meetings with just me to tell me that, um, you know, that to be you know a worthy woman in the in the church, you know, to be to be a you know a, a, the kind of spouse that God would want me to be. I need to you know, send Jamie back out on her mission first and to, to, be, to be supportive of that instead of to, to go on with our plans to get married. Um, and I just was so 
<sighs> so insulted, first of all, to be told that I wasn't feeling enough remorse just for keeping my composure in front of my state president. Like, I have to... <laughs> If you could see all the crying I'd done in my own time, you know, all the pain that I felt on my own time. Um, I don't think he would have said that. Um, but we tried so hard to just, to just put it past us and um, move on to the next chapter of our lives because we were, uh, we were sent home and... And what else were we to do? Like, I, if, I wasn't like, going to go back out. Yeah, that was if, a big aspect of it. I told Madeline as yeah, soon as I got back that and, I'm and, done. And I, and I wasn't going to that. try to push you on a mission when that wasn't your plan and right. it wasn't our plan. You know, we were both forcefully sent home from our missions. We had given our effort um, and denied it. And, um, and so we... Um, and I just felt like socially, we felt like we, like we only had each other when we yeah, returned. Yeah, so when I got back from, from the MTC, my family moved to St. George. And so I moved into their house for a bit, but then their house went back to the renters. And so I just moved into my car um, and I stayed like a couple nights at my dad's. And then I moved into an abandoned house um, and I got two jobs and Madeline and I just and lived. We both got two jobs. Yeah, we both got two jobs, to and just we try just to lived. Save up for some kind of an apartment together. Yeah, uh, and we we wanted to. You know, we felt so betrayed by the church, but we were our testimonies were so strong in God, even though we had been betrayed by so many people, whom we thought cared about us, whom we felt cared about us. Yeah. Um, that we, you know. It, it was really conflicting to, f to just feel that sense of, uh, of humiliation we and sat. your identity kind of ripped away from you. That we kind of only had each other to understand each other, um, and we chose to, to get married. And we told our stake presidents this, um, and um, my stake president told us, um, you know, I'm not comfortable with you being sealed in the temple right now. Um, but I want you two to pray about it. Pray about, pray and ask God like what date he'd feel comfortable with you being sealed. And we, and did. we took it seriously and we prayed and we, and we prayed and we prayed and we felt, we both felt like God had provided us with a, you know, a date. date. Yeah. And we went back to my stake president and told him and it was sometime he said, like no. a few months away and he said, N no, I don't feel comfortable with that. And, and I feel like just so frustrated that all these things that, that I felt like God was inspiring me to feel were just so quickly swept aside by the authority figures. Like, you know, what you're feeling isn't real and what I'm feeling is. And that's, that's actually something that's kind of tricky is we're taught personal revelation. Yeah. Versus, but, but their revelation yeah. always yeah. trumps And my ours personal time, revelation right? was never real was never valued as real revelation and that was so frustrating to me to feel like to feel such a strong you know feeling that I that I couldn't deny that was so important to me um you know to trust myself to trust these instincts to trust Jamie my future spouse and to return to my trek paw state president and have him tell me that he wouldn't you know, grant me a, a temple recommend. Um, it was deeply frustrating. And we went well, to your state Yeah, president. so at one point we decided to just, we were going to get, well, we were considering civil marriage, but my big mm -hmm. thing with my stake president was trying to tell him to stop convincing me to go back on a mission. Yeah. But he wouldn't move past that. He said, this is prophetic. You need to go back out on a mission. Yeah. And I said, I don't have the same... Feelings, feelings about that yeah, like and he said so but he turns to madeline and he says if i were you i would run away from him as fast as you can yeah. and we're sitting in an interview together like and he yeah. just says that and i'm like, right here so, like so like you need to get away from this person and it just felt like terrifying to be like i don't know to feel like threatened like you know like like he knew this you know nasty horrible thing was going to happen in our futures if we trusted our 
Our instincts are what the church said. Our spirituality instead of the authorities' spirituality. Yeah. Um, and so we gave up on trying to be <laughs> temple married yeah. because because <laughs> yeah, we knew, gave up on all we that. knew <laughs> our instincts, we knew our spirituality, and we knew each other, and we knew what we you know promised to each other, and we, what we felt like we had to do, and so we. We're civilly married in my backyard. Yeah, we walked out of, after the interview, we walked out to the car and I'm like, so do you just want to get married? Like, just get like, married? Of course, and she's like, of yeah. course, that's our plan. And we knew that, like, yeah. after being <laughs> married civilly um, and then, like, being temple worthy for a year, you can be sealed in the temple. So we're like, yeah. it would be so much easier to just be civilly married and live our happy married Mormon lives together and then be able to be sealed without any... Yeah push back about it so we so we did we were married and kind of inactive for a while when mm-hmm. we got married and then we went back to church and our bishop at our ward was my dad's bishop in missouri yeah. growing up which was like yeah was super so random strange. but um but anyway so we like went through a process with him and then uh we're finally cleared to be sealed yeah. in a manti temple mm-hmm. and so we did that actually and we we went back to church yeah. and we were really in, involved members um i was the the um the second counselor of the elders quorum um for yeah. a while i think the day we got sealed was the day after i figured out i was pregnant oh yeah and yeah so madeline I got pregnant that feeling just so like you know all three of us are united yeah. as a family and it was really special to feel like you know after so much trauma you know we were finally able to to receive the blessings that we had fought so hard for and been denied i had been i had a challenging moment that day though because when we were going to get sealed i was pulled aside into a room and and this man sort of grilled me about my marriage so far like we had had our temple recommends. We were there to get sealed. Everything. It was a great day, but then I got pulled into mm-hmm. another room, and that's it's it's a I recurring. Yeah, it didn't happen, didn't happen to happen Madeline, to um, but yeah. So I was taken into a room, and he basically asked me about my marriage, and about how we had been with each other, and and all this stuff, and then was like, okay, like I think that you guys are ready to get sealed, as if like. I don't know, as if yeah. that hadn't already been, been decided. Determined. We had the temple recommendation. Yeah, and... exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So we did that. Um, do you want me to just like jump? I don't know how much time we have. I can jump a little. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to. Um, I think the next maybe. Th- I mean, this is beautiful, and this is worthy of a of a three to four hour interview at a minimum. Maybe <laughs> you ever want maybe to be ten, with but <laughs> but. Um, we won't have that time today. Yeah, so that's fine. We'd be happy so you, to meet again. Yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, let's 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 do at least the kind of overview. Yeah. Um, but your story has been so harrowing. I that wasn't even the main reason we no did the interview. But we've yeah. covered inappropriate bishops' interviews. We've yeah. covered yeah. just yeah, the trauma. sexual standards of the church yeah. and and yeah. Looking early through mission your website, return. Like sort by topic. I'm like. <laughs> Boy, which topic would mine go into? I don't even know. Several, yeah. several, yeah. including early mission return. That's yeah. also one that we've done a, yeah, we've a series on. The fallout for that was big. We can talk about all these things, but yeah, but yeah, it gets that's. So, um, so, but you were married in the temple. Yes. yes. How did they let you? Well, we just Different. waited a year. Well, yeah. If you and then they're okay. Well, yeah, because yeah, like you're married, so like nothing you're doing is a sin <laughs> anymore. So like it did we feel fine. kind of weird, yeah, like going yeah. in and being like, "Hey, we've been married for a year. We're like spouses and very close they're to each like, other. Okay, Can so we we, we, be we ruined like, your your social reputations and you know <laughs> reputations in the church over a blowjob?" Yeah. <laughs> I love but it. But you've been having regular sex for a year, but you're married, so go so ahead it's and get okay. So now, now you can get sealed. <laughs> it yeah. did feel kind of strange. <laughs> oh my god! But um, <laughs> but yeah. So so we were really devout Mormon, though. I need to yeah. like acknowledge that for probably a solid two years, maybe a little more. Mm-hmm. And while we were married, um, but then um, we started to have. And it was hard. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was hard. There were challenges. I feel yeah. like it was hard to be devout Mormon. Yeah, no, that's something Going that's... Going to the temple together, I feel like, was extremely challenging. We have to 
how you probably have to be careful about i don't know how do you feel like when we talk about temple things that's kind of like a i don't have to because like specific, I, don't, I can say it was challenging if it's an important part of your journey mention it well yeah it's very very difficult to be in a temple environment and constantly see that your wife has to has to um almost like swear allegiance to you yeah. while you swear allegiance to God. And, and that's, I felt like that, that was creates further a very... marginalizing my personal relationship with God too, to feel like, you know, no matter who it was, there was always a middleman. That There's my always a man personal too. Relationship, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like my personal relationship with God always felt discounted. And um, that was always really frustrating to me to feel like um, just so like so frustrated and angry with these policies in the church that just made me feel marginalized and my spirituality and relationship with God feel unimportant or fake, counterfeit, um, without any chance to defend myself. Um, but that these horrible, traumatizing feelings that I was feeling were supposed to be the right ones, um, supposed to be, you know, w when I when I was a devout, worthy member was miserable in so many ways yeah. and to feel like like I wasn't living my true values like I wasn't living my life to my fullest and to picture you know spending the rest of my life that way was really painful I think it created a lot of well there was some disconnect between us that formed because mm -hmm. of the church because we were trying to be devout. And one mm -hmm. of the challenging things with the church is that they're wrong. They're mm -hmm. wrong in a lot of ways, yeah. like on a, we'll say like an objective level, yeah. like on a humanistic level. Um, and so when I'm trying to serve this this church, this this God of, of Mormonism, I, I, I took on a role that I didn't want to take. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was authoritative. Yeah. And it was bad, and I didn't. And it wasn't it who didn't we enrich, were when yeah. we fell in love, you know. Yeah. And so it was really a, a strain to try to uphold standards that weren't our own, values that weren't our own, um, and to to suppress the ones that were because they were supposed supposedly wrong, and to feel like we were only living you know, half our lives because we had to suppress so much. Yeah, and we had I to actually treat each other. You know, I, I missed the conversations we would have in high school where I knew that they weren't ones I could have with devout Mormons, but that they felt so freeing and comfortable to me because, because Jamie helped me feel like, like I didn't need to be ashamed to have the values that I did. But then we, I feel like the church kind of held us hostage against yeah. each other. Like if we try to talk about our true values, then it we're would create not conflict. Being, devout and we'd have to yeah. we have to be like okay well is that in line with the church and for yeah, some things madeline would be more be like, headstrong and mm -hmm. for a lot of things i would be more headstrong yeah. for me it felt like the first time in my life that i was taking the church seriously and i actually believed it and for me that was that made a big difference as soon mm -hmm. as i stopped believing in the church none of it mattered mm -hmm. i didn't even i didn't have any obligation to these archaic yeah hurtful uh, yeah hurtful you know. positions yeah. um you know, I, I personally feel like I've seen generations of, of men in my life who have been put on the wrong side and have taken responsibility for that um, or, like, you know, owned it, I guess, uh, so to speak, um, and, and have been abusive because of it. Yeah. You know, and, and so my experience uh, basically being a devout married church member um, was that there, it, it was hard to... I guess to have as cohesive of a marriage as yeah. as especially as we do now, yeah, but like as we could have. Yeah, you to be have. married to the church before married to each other. Yeah, and and that felt very present. Um, yeah. And so, but eventually, like, it wasn't sustainable. Questions are, arose, and we yeah. got frustrated. I started walking out of Sunday school because yeah. I would get mad at some of the sexism that I feel mm -hmm. like I was hearing in scripture, and then, and then the policy changed. Yeah. Where um, they said that children of same-sex couples could not be, be members of the church yeah, or be baptized until 18. Yeah, members of the church, yeah. And they have to disavow the relationship of their parents yeah. in order to do so. And I couldn't... Which is very applicable. And I couldn't applicable. support that, you know, because I was that child. And I knew my mom's relationship. I knew my own, 
you know, orientation, my own feelings, and that it wasn't, and that they were wrong. You know, that, that it wasn't... That the church you know, was wrong. The, the church, okay. Sorry. That <laughs> Your the church, feelings were yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, not my own feelings, <laughs> but that the church was wrong, that they're not, you know, bad, you know, sinful, disrespectful, tearing apart the family. It's just love. You know, I feel like love is fought against more than hate. And that's so frustrating to me to feel like, um, to put that weight on a, on a child, on a family, um, that it's not their decision anymore uh, between the parents and the children like it was for me with my mom uh, and my dad. To make that decision for myself, um, I felt like went completely against everything I've been taught about um, accountability, personal you know, a- autonomy, and just uh, um, taking you know, control of your own spirituality as a member of the church. Um, and, and, and it really hurt me to think that if I was eight years old at the time of that announcement, that I would have been that child who, you know, when all my friends were being baptized at eight years old, I wouldn't be allowed to be. When and they at, were, this, at this point, you had already felt so much disconnect. You, yeah, have, you always have a mediator you know, between already, you and God. You I have, had already pushed through so much trauma with the church that this just... Broke the camera's like, back. How, like, I, I didn't know how much, you know, how much I could disavow myself and my own values to keep in line with the church. Because, because I knew my values... And I felt, you know, constantly like I had to suppress them or, or um, justify them, justify, you know, like I only feel this way because I've been raised differently than everybody else, and so that's why everybody. But like I, that's firsthand experience, and that shouldn't be discounted. You know, I, I had so many people um, try to explain to me that this policy was to help. Uh, the relationship between parents and children and, you know, my parents are very mature and our relationship, you know, deciding about, you know, how we would manage um, our religious life was handled very well. But even if it's not, it's so personal that to take that autonomy away from everybody in that situation... um, it puts children in an unfair position. It puts parents in an unfair position, you know, where they feel like they are causing this to their children, where children, if they, you know, decide to be baptized at 18, have to be disloyal have to, to their confront families. a very yeah, it's, large... It's horrible. And, um, that, that just really and to feel set. like it was just to protect, you know, to be told it was for t- to protect, you know, a little like spats about whether your kids are going to get baptized or not is such the tip of the iceberg of how hard that uh, conversation became after the the policy change. Yeah, there was that big thing about whether or not it was even doctrine, and it was very yeah. sketchy. And at that point, I and it just felt I like just, they were trying, you know, like you know, it it just felt so polarizing and and so like it could tear families apart that it would just. Um, I imagined my own life, you know, being that child. And it, the LDS Church is a very social religion, um, as many religions are. And just to, to imagine as an eight-year-old making the decision, like, okay, in 10 years, I'm willing to be baptized and disavow my parents, to think about how long those 10 years feel to a child and how I mean that's yeah and how young you are and how little you know and understand um, to have that pressure put on you and to be consistent with your choice while all your friends are being baptized without you all your friends are passing the sacrament without you all your friends are going to the temple together without you all your friends are you know getting mission calls without you that that's your entire ch- you know childhood and adolescence um a very crucial, uh, you know, church checkpoints that you miss. Um, I at this while waiting to disavow your parents, and it just 
I wouldn't have been able to withstand that, and I don't know any child that would, and even if they could, it's completely... Um, well, f- just really coming sad. from a prophetic source, it really misses the mark on yeah. on what that human experience is. Yeah. And and it, if for me, it felt like that that was enough. I had had enough mm-hmm. of this. So okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to do what the church has always told me not to do. I'm going to read about the church mm-hmm. objectively. Mm-hmm. And within a week, I resigned. What did you read? The CES letter. How'd you find it? My friend sent it to me because he saw me on Facebook. I said, I don't know why this policy is going on. You know, it's really throwing me off, but just have faith. Yeah. And my friend was like, here, read this. And of course I didn't, I didn't. CES letter, letter to CES director. Yeah. Letter to CES CES. CES.org. I'm just, some people may not know what you're reading. Yes. No, read it. And, and you know, if you have to, he links all the sources in it. It's like, you can get a confirmation from where this information comes from. Um, and it just, I, what was interesting about that is Jamie read it before I did. Yeah. And was like on a road trip. Yeah, I was, mo- I was going up to Salt Lake for work. And just called me and said, Madeline, I'm resigning from the church. The church isn't true. I'm like, we haven't yeah, even a- talked about this. What are you talking about? Yeah, like, I just said, I called I'm, her. I'm like, the Book of Mormon's not a true book. I'm Joseph like, Smith yeah. is not a prophet. He was, a, you know, we can talk yeah. about that later. And but I just um, thought like, we, we were, I know we're upset about this policy change, but... We haven't had this conversation. Like, come home and talk to me in person. Um, and Jamie told me about the CES letter, and I was wary, as many Mormons are, because you know, if something can get my wife to change her opinion in one road trip up north, uh, like that was really serious, and I didn't know what this document was. <laughs> um, so I like put off reading it for. At least a week or so. Um, oh, I think it was like a month because it wasn't. Okay. I I resigned in November, and then it wasn't until That's the end true. of December That's that you true. removed your records. Yeah, it was. I was like nervous to read it, but um, but yeah, when I as I read it, I was just like shocked uh, at how uncharacter not uncharacteristic because I had nothing to compare it to, but it wasn't the anti Mormon literature that I had been taught to expect. You know, it wasn't. It's just the facts. It, it wasn't and an it analysis, wasn't just maybe. But. Church bashing. It was asking questions yeah. that I had asked myself and answering them with links to LDS.org, links to scriptures. Yeah, I, like, I remember there were we read sources we read, that were answering these questions, and I just thought, we read DNC 132, hmm. right on that road trip, and I feel like that that has always yeah. been in the Doctrine and Covenants, but we read it. And yeah. and we're just appalled, yeah. like completely thrown off that yeah. this is the this is the doctrine that we had been representing and supporting, and yeah. like we had read the Book of Mormon, read Doctrine and Covenants, so yeah. to read it now, sort of with, you know, without these rose colored glasses, yeah. you know, just from from a like, purely you know, like this analytical is what we are sacrificing our values to support wasn't worth it anymore. We wanted to be our full selves. We wanted to be our authentic, you know, selves that we. You know, if there is a God and is an afterlife that we could feel comfortable defending our decisions to. Um, We wanted to live in a way that we felt comfortable and, you know, uh, healthy. And um, we couldn't do that in the church. And so we left. We Mm -hmm. left the church. And that was a pretty big bombshell so yeah we think about like our mission coming home for missions was traumatizing and then leaving the church was very traumatizing for us yeah and then coming out has been pretty good in our lives yeah so So, wow uh yeah this is a lot (laughs) this is so brilliant The, the i have to say the listening audience we've had a we had some technical glitches so we lost some people but we we've had a strong audience the whole oh, way. Okay. And, yeah, uh, thanks for listening to us. People are saying this is, I, I'll just read a couple. Linda says, uh, hi Linda, this is the most <laughs> raw and moving interview of I've, I have ever witnessed on Mormon Stories podcast and beyond. <sighs> wow, I appreciate their courage in authentically sharing their stories. Please, please schedule additional time with this amazing couple. <laughs> Tyler writes, a beautiful couple. It's tragic that they had to be put through so much unnecessary trauma and abuse at the hands of a church. And people who really uh, think they are doing God's will, I'm so glad they found their way out. Um, uh, Connie writes, "Reading about the church is why I left." Donna writes, "One of your most poignant interviews, 
two beautiful, uh, amazing human beings. So wow. uh, thank you for yeah. thank you for letting us come in and share this. Thank this you. is something that we've been we've talked about to analyze and try to understand for years yeah, and to yes. have <laughs> yeah for, to finally be Main able to topic of conversation for yeah. a long time. What are you feeling, Madeline? Um, grateful to have support when I felt so isolated for so long. You know, it's um, it's. The, the shame you're told to feel is so vivid um, that it's, I feel like I'm tricked into humiliation, you know, instead of into trusting myself, instead of into bravery. It's gaslighting a lot. Um, and it completely isolated me. Um, it was the worst feeling of my life to feel just like I had no one to to turn to, to be, to be honest and authentic with, even when I felt, you know, like I was being my best self um, because it wasn't doctrinally good enough, you know, it wasn't church standards, you know, in, in yeah, line that's... that like living uh, an out of the ordinary life is wrong. Something that has been, I, I've had to, sp- well, I've taken it upon myself to specifically communicate to family members and, and friends and associates in my life that, like, I, I know what you think is going on in my life is bad, and it's yeah. not. I am, I am better than uh, I have ever mm-hmm. been in my entire life. It causes so much passive aggression where uh, assumptions are made about you, but nobody speaks them to you. So you can't even defend them because it just becomes, you know, the unspoken sin, you know, that like, that you, uh, I didn't know how, I, you know, still don't know how to discuss so many of these issues with my family. Um, yeah, we don't. I wonder if they're going to, hi family, yeah. if you watch this. I, I love you. Um, <laughs> it's just hard to know, um, to know that our beliefs and values differ so dramatically that um that I don't know you know what to say to to be understood and I've learned that um that the that the experiences of feeling understood and valued um and trusted are the most important human interactions in my life like I um I don't know how to live without them, and uh, it's it's hard to even in you know silent um, what's the word? just like you know accepting you know, tolerating tolerating each other's you know lifestyles without feeling comfortable talking about them has been really challenging because. Um, well, you want to commit, we're social beings. Yeah, because, You know, yeah, like, it's hard to it's, just to have these elephants in the room and just for, you know, like, for yeah. peace and harmony's sake, not bring up the fact yeah, that like, I have been like, abused and traumatized and yeah. hurt and challenged and, and beaten be down by this that church. We, yeah. you know, are just, you know, lazy or We just want to drink coffee now or, or want to, you know, are, yeah. are, have, you know, lost <laughs> our, you know our light or whatever, our faith in God, like it's just so hard to have, to, to be, to have these assumptions made that make it completely um, impossible to feel heard by loved ones because I've, I've felt overlooked instead of genuinely cared for. Um, I mean, I do have to like make a little note because like our parents have been, no, yeah, you know, amazing. Like we have a lot of amazing family members yeah. and good people in our lives. So like I don't want to like shy yeah, over that, no, but, but it's just like a general. You know, I mean, being up in the Logan family still, and outside like, the family, you know, it's just like you. I felt like, you know, like I finally felt comfortable in my skin, comfortable in, you know, upholding my own values and in my own life, living the way I do. I feel more confident than ever. And yet I still feel like um, because I'm seen as the outsider, because, you know, anti, 
not anti Mormon. Not that post Mormon is post Mormon. People see post Mormon you know, as anti Mormon. Which... Yeah, that like it's one and the same. That like that because you're you know you left the church. It's something that you can't discuss with each other, and it uh, created these really um, big voids where like the biggest, most traumatic and painful and lonely moments in my life had to remain lonely. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it's, you know, we're both, it, we both are in therapy for a yeah. lot of these, for, you know, yeah. multitudes of things, but a lot of it is the church. And I, I yeah. speak to my therapist and it's that, you know, he says, you know, up in Logan, I came from out of state and this is just <clears throat> staggering yeah. how many people come in here and, and their trauma is, is, is sourced from the church. Mm. And, you know, before transitioning, we didn't have a community up there. Yeah. And, and our neighbors have been really nice to us and stuff. But that's just, you know, living in, in Utah, after you know what it's like, like after leaving the church, you have to find, yeah. you're being your best self and you yeah. are more, more isolated yeah. than like maybe to, ever To before. be trying your best and feeling better than you ever have, but because you're not, you know, a, a worthy member of the church, you can never be at the tier of respect that you could have. Been. And there was That's a, hard to feel. there was a weird, cause I, I've kind of stayed at home with Lydia a lot and our, our daughter. And, um, and there is definitely that weird dynamic of like, I go to be with the moms and the moms don't want to talk to me. Yeah. I've got tattoos. I have, yeah. you know, there's a lot of like those, those things. And, and yeah. obviously like this reflects a higher culture, but it adds up yeah. to be my experience. And my experience yeah. is what drives me I to make the decisions so I do. surface based, I feel like to, to be, and to come from the positions that we're in, uh, and especially yeah. I feel like where I came from, like I, I was so devout my entire childhood, yeah. adolescence. I was a really obedient, you know, a member and student, a really good student. Like I just tried to be a people pleaser and tried to get good grades and meet all the expectations and to be trying to meet those expectations and still come up short out of, because of things that are out of my control. Um, is a really frustrating yeah, thing for my was, personality. It was really interesting. I, th I think when we left the church, the most common message I got from people trying to get us back was, you are good enough. Yeah. Like, you're good enough. Come be here. Like, yeah. you're good enough to be here. And it's like, yeah. well, why couldn't I have been good enough when I was on my mission? Yeah. Why couldn't I have been good enough when I was actually, when I actually cared about the church? Yeah, and why can't I be good enough <laughs> Leaving following it. my own values and feeling, you know, yeah. good well, about Well, you can my... be. You are. Yeah, but just you know? like in, in <laughs> you know, our... In our, um, you know, neighborhoods, yeah. in our culture. So, yeah. And that's why the culture, you know, even if it is different from the doctrine, is damaging enough to damage my life. And uh, it's... I, I think that, uh, like, just in this final context of, like, where we are in the church, the thing that has kind of taken me away from it. In fact, I don't discuss it a lot. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't read about it a lot. I don't even really ever think about the church mm -hmm. anymore. And that's been because, um, you know, like I kind of want to touch a little bit on the fact that when we, when I transitioned, Madeline had already come out to me mm -hmm. as queer. Mm -hmm. um, and no one else. And yeah, no one else, <laughs> but just me. And so then I came out to Madeline like very casually, just like I think. Over text. Um, yeah, over text. <laughs> What'd you say? Um, I said, I really think I'm trans. Jen, I, yeah, I really think I'm trans. I think that's what yeah. I said. And I yeah. said, I'll, we'll talk about it later when it's yeah, not we'll through text. About, and well, she you said, you were at work. What year was this? This was in the list last, last fall. Last year. Last year. Okay. End like of the October. summer, right? October, right? Of yeah. 2017. 17. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this was two years after you kind of left the church. Yeah. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had left the church and we kind of spent those two years. Honestly, we were pretty just bitter about it. And I spent a lot of time like being, I feel like um, isn't, there are so many well, I was, feelings though. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like yeah. there was bitterness because there was trauma. There was bitterness because there was abuse and pain. And, you know, because, because my feelings were marginalized because, mm. you know, I yeah. could never be good enough, but there was also so much pain that I think is overlooked a lot. Um, as an ex-Mormon that so much of it is chalked up to just bitterness yeah. when so much of it is, is really, um, grief. Uh, it's, it's hard living on campus and seeing, you know, maybe like four or five 
missionary companionships every single time I go to class Mm -hmm. when my my mission experience was one of the most traumatizing experiences of my life and and I go out every day and I see these young men who are basically in the same position I was acting like they know yeah better than I do about yeah. the truthfulness of this organize of After this gone organization so of this business and, and basically to, and, and to feel like you know leaving the church it wasn't just just laziness just bitterness just sin it was pain it was pain of losing so much pain one of the most important relationships of my life with you know with the God that I believed in with the church that I believed in fully that I trusted to lose that trust to feel betrayed um was so devastating was so devastating and um yeah so we spent a long time and to feel like uh in a way it was freeing to be able to focus on my own values and my own confidence and to love myself and to trust myself but in another way I felt like the rug had pulled been pulled from beneath my feet this thing that I wanted to be true wasn't wasn't that I couldn't believe in it anymore and I had I I was just stuck in a void like there there was nothing below me to catch my fall except for myself and um and I you know to, to discover that from the ground up is terrifying and amazing to be able to learn to trust myself and regain a relationship with myself that much, but to at the sacrifice of losing. And it's been it's been really so important rebuilding our relationship too, because it's like we came full circle at this point. I went through mm-hmm. this this awful. To be honest, it was this hyper masculine. Mm-hmm. I I, I want to use that word because it was toxic mm-hmm. hyper masculinity mm-hmm. that to me drove me away from yeah. Madeline during our church years and yeah. um, and, and from and us from who. Who we knew. Yeah, who we knew we were, and who we knew each other to be. In. Yeah, and and at this at this point, like when I transitioned, it really became, let's like we're let's stop being angry. Let's figure out like how to be healthy. Let's figure mm-hmm. out how to, you know, have therapy mm-hmm. work. Have, um, yeah, you know, bring our lives back together. Learn how to communicate what we're feeling and not just what we we feel like we're supposed to yeah. be saying to each other and while hiding you know, what we're actually feeling has been really a healthy transition. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because a lot of the times mm-hmm. when we bring up, well, <laughs> it's it's obvious that I'm trans, but I, yeah. when that is sort of acknowledged, it's, it's a, okay, how are you guys getting through that? But for us, it's almost, at least in my experience, it's almost been, thank like, this is our goodness th- that I yeah. figured this out oh, when I yeah. did. yeah, you know, and to, and and to it's know been that so good. crises aren't bad, they're just hard yeah, they aren't can be... always bad they they can just be really difficult and you know difficult can be painful but it can be so so worth it and um yeah in a way Jamie coming out to me as transgender um well personally like when she sent me a text coming out to me I'm just like okay let's talk about it when you get yeah, home like, I, like it sounds didn't good. phase me at all like uh, I didn't care <laughs> like you're my person and I love you for who you are and not what um you know, not what reproductive system you have, not what hormones are in your body, not what, uh, you know, societal elements are that are brought into gender. Like, I love you hormones for you. <laughs> um, but I, so I feel like the most difficult parts of this transition were, um, was fear of uh, social repercussion repercussions and, and, and the future. And how that would affect our anxieties yeah. and depression and you know, our interactions because of our fear of the way we would be treated because of it. It very much came to a point, though, where we were like, we need to own up to our lifestyle. Like, and so we, we got involved. Yeah, Yeah, we started, we started reaching out and being LGBTQIA plus advocates and um, trying to share. At Utah State. Yeah, at Utah Utah State. 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 And, and, you know, just like in general, we try to be, but yeah, at Utah State specifically. Which is um, so, you know... Such a liberating feeling for me, especially because I had been, you know, an ally and a member of this community internally since I was a child. To feel like I can be open about it just um, has been so freeing in so many ways. 
Yeah, we have a lot. Well, I personally have a lot more courage, and um, yeah. I think, yeah, now than I, yeah, than I even had six months ago. It's been, yeah. it's been, and really... it radiates to every part of yeah. our lives. Like being able to trust yourself in your core values and your in your beliefs, in the way you spend your time, in the way you manage your money, in like the organizations being able to just trust you like yourself, yeah, support in and, the way yeah. you live your life allows you to. Um, to expand so much in a way where if you're trying to stay inside, you know, the lines, fit inside these puzzle pieces, you know, that aren't <laughs> yours, um, it become you get really, you know, focused in on something that doesn't fit you and it's frustrating. Yeah. But like, you're like, why since, isn't this working? But you know, leaving the church, I feel like we've been able to focus on our relationship and our education on the things we know um, we do have right now yeah not the things we might have someday and our roles as parents even you know to to feel like looking back to the beginning of our marriage when you were so frustrated trying to find a you know trying to be the provider and i was so frustrated yeah now we've being at home and i'm like i'll be the computer scientist we're good. Yeah, this is what I I'll want the, in life. You're like, <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I do my, my things. I study earth science yeah. and environmental policy and yeah. planning. But Madeline, I was going to say you're the housewife, but you're more than the housewife. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was no, going to say. We're I, both very involved in school and extracurricular. Yeah, Madeline like, I feel just like started. I'm able a, to take on so much more and focus on so much more when they're my things that I'm passionate about, that I value truly. Yeah, mention the women's leadership oh, yeah. thing. So this yeah. past year, I've been involved in this awesome organization at uh, USU. Um, the Women's Leadership Initiative, um, which is provided uh, by the Center for Women and Gender Studies. Um, And it's just been really, really amazing for me to gain these, to gain skills in, you know, confidence for myself, in confidence leading others, in, um, you know, learning the challenges of being a woman in the workplace and uh, how to, you know, combat that and how to um, be able to feel, you know, like have these, uh, this program available to me to, to be, uh, to teach me confidence in myself. Um, I've loved it and I graduated from it um, in April and I was talking to the director of the program about my input, as I often did, she would ask me after every session, you know, questions that she had and uh, thoughts that she had, and I'd give her my input, and I was sad that it was our last meeting, and I asked her if she had any students on their advisory board, and she said she didn't, and I said, can I start a student advisory board for this organization? And she said, of course you can, and so I've, yeah. uh, I'm so excited to to be leading that this next school year, and I'm hoping to... Um, to kind of explore uh, that uh, the path of inclusivity of like what um, what our goals are as serving women in the workplace and how we can help trans women feel included and help my you know minorities feel included help help just these issues that segregate us even as you know men and women you know, instead of segregating to, though women do have, you know, particular uh, um, challenges in the workplace, um, I think that there are so many other um, groups that face very similar challenges that if we don't focus so much on, you know, one type of person who faces these challenges, but what these challenges are in general, and how we can, instead of seeing each other by gender, just help everybody feel included, no matter what your gender is, no matter if your gender has a name, you know, like, it it doesn't matter, we're all human, and we all deserve to be treated with respect, and with trust, and with opportunity, and validation, and love. Um, I love it. At, this, we'll at the same time, I was selected to be president of the Gay Straight Alliance, the, mm-hmm. LG, the Life Love is for Everyone Club at USU. They're going through a new And change. at this, yeah, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna change it. But, but yeah, that's like uh, I've been involved in these these uh, panels, and one of the things we we do, and a lot of people are involved in, is is this encircle group, which is where we speak to LDS mm-hmm. um, 
youth and, and adults and stuff about how to be allies mm -hmm. about the LGBTQIA plus experience um, things like that and and it's it's been very different because I've had a shift in perspective from very clearly separating the organization of the church from the members and how I can connect with those members and yeah. and realizing that I have a lot more in common with them than I have different yeah. from them because mormons and, and ex mormons aren't opposites yeah we're just, <laughs> we're all human <laughs> yeah we're, that organization does yeah. not cr make your life yeah and uh, and yeah. so yeah i really want to bridge the gap between members and non-members and questioning and how to find people respect, and, how to talk about uh, topics that isolate us and segregate us just because we're in we don't know how to talk about them just because we're uncomfortable to talk about them we've never been taught how to talk about them just to bring those topics out in the open and say like i don't bite like let's have a conversation and learn how to respect each other yeah could you imagine if everybody just fully yeah. healthily communicated like what they needed to yeah. i think that yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i love it well um i do not want this interview to end <laughs> this has been the perfect interview oh, uh, to sure. to kick off uh, Pride Weekend in Salt Lake City. You are literally one of the most endearing, insightful, wise, loving guests we've ever had on Mormon Stories. And we're 920 plus episodes <laughs> in. Uh, I don't know if I believe in a divine being, but I feel like this was meant to be and I don't know how. But I love you guys and our audience has loved you and... You're inspiring and you're, inspiring, you're courageous John. and you are going to help so many people with this interview. And I just, I want to like be in your family. <laughs> you're I, always welcome. Can I be in your family? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> next time, next time you're in Logan, yeah, we'll cook you dinner. I, I'm yeah. a good cook. She is. I like my She's family. So much better than me. I want to I join. Can, can we merge our families? I like mine. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, the, the two of you that I know, I love. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, w I, we have to run, even though I don't want this to end. Maybe we'll figure out a way to get you back on yeah. Mormon stories we'll talk. in other ways. We'll Please. talk. Yes. Let's talk more, but let's have you each give a closing testimony or <laughs> whatever you want to say. Closing remarks. And, uh, yeah. And, and let's just say, Madeline, let's give you the first shot because <laughs> We'll give you the last word. Is that all right? Is that Jamie? okay with you? Of course. Is that all right? Yeah. Of course. Okay. That sounds great. Closing statement. Okay. Um, I feel like this has to be profound and I don't know how to make it be. It be simple. Whatever but, you want. Um, I guess thank you everyone who's listened um, and who will continue to listen in the future to our episode. Um, and whoever you are, however you identify, um, Whatever your religious beliefs or sexual orientation or gender identity or, you know, race, yeah, race, race anything, yeah, anything, dynamic. you know, whether you like, you know, Pokemon or not, like just <laughs> we're all one. We can all be one and we don't need to segregate ourselves because of any little group that we create as humans. We create these groups as humans and they are important, but they can also segregate. And, um, and I think it's important to use the groups that we create to find those um, who can help us feel positivity and love and support and help us to grow as human beings rather than to tear each other down or judge each other or um, you know, limit each other because we are capable of so much. Human beings are capable of so much if we allow ourselves to be and don't focus on petty things. Um, and so just love each other. And Beautiful. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, um, Madeline. Jamie. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, something that a lot of trans individuals struggle with is like suicidal ideation and feeling like there isn't, you know, that, that dread of like, oh no, what am I going to do? Or like, I'm, I am gay or I am trans or I am bi or I am pan or any of these, you know, things that can feel scary. Um, you know, the, the best way to be is just not afraid. Because what, what could possibly, 
you know, like there's consequences to your situation. You have to be smart um, when being your true self, but strive to be your true self. Make the changes that you need to make to be your true self. Mm -hmm. Um, Because right now, just to be honest, I'm currently trying my best and doing my best to make up for for behaviors and attitudes and actions that I took when I thought I was doing the right thing based on what I was told, but I didn't feel like I was doing the right thing. And don't get put in that position where it doesn't feel right, but you're doing it because you're told to. That's That means it's not right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and in addition to that, love yourself um, and other people will feel your love. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been really hard for me, to be honest. There was a lot of months where I didn't feel like I could transition. And so I felt stuck. Stuck is what I like to call it. Um, I just felt stuck, but I pushed forward and I am the happiest I've probably ever been in my entire life. It's difficult, but I'm very happy. And if you're LGBTQIA+, questioning anything like that there is a place for you in fact come stay with us um <laughs> in our big family in our big family yeah, yeah. yeah. come hang out with family. john yeah, yeah. 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 and that's that's from my <laughs> heart i know oh, that yeah. you were supposed to have the last no, words but it. i wanted to say um following up on that that any of you who feel isolated who feel you know who feel suicidal who feel depressed and don't know how to open up to people about how you feel, um, don't let yourself stay isolated because it doesn't get better in isolation. You need to find, you need to find a community. You need to find people who help you feel validated and valued and loved because you are. They you just exist. Need, they exist. This world has seven billion people in it. They exist. Trust me. People love you. You just need to find the right people and not surround yourself by people who make you feel worthless because you're not. Love it. I love you. (laughs) I love it. Most beautiful couple ever. (laughs) So beautiful. I'm I'm overwhelmed. I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for taking off work, arranging babysitting, everything you had to do to get down (laughs) here. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone for listening now and in the future. Thanks for your support. Go to Pride, Salt Lake City if you're around. Enjoy it. Love your LGBTQ friends and family. Love your LGBTQ self. Love your LGBTQ ally self. Lots of LGBTQ plus love. We can all be one. Let's do, it. Let's do it. Thanks for supporting Mormon Stories. Check us out again soon. We love you. Have a great weekend. Take care, you guys. Thank you. Hi. Love you guys.